All right, good evening everyone. Welcome to uh, Devotions on this Friday night. Hope and pray that you are doing well and that you've had a wonderful day and uh, you're looking forward to the weekend. Uh, it's one of our ladies' birthdays today. Our secretary, our treasurer, Carolyn Ross. Happy birthday. Many birthday blessings been going out. Very special day today. She won't be watching. Her husband's taking her out, having a wonderful time. So uh, very, uh, very grateful for that. So happy birthday, Carolyn. Remember being Friday, we've got the weekend ahead of us. We've got Sunday before us, so let's be in prayer in regards to our Sunday services. Let's pray for, uh, for the presence of the Lord. Judy, good evening. Let's pray for a moving of the Spirit in our services. We need the work of the Spirit to be very prevalent in, uh, in our churches. So be in prayer about that. And I pretty pray that wherever you go and worship, that you have a wonderful time and that you have a blessed time, that you hear from God. So uh, I pray that that be the case. All right, now, uh, we're going to get into it tonight. We're just going to go as the Lord leads. I I went and visited Tracy today. Uh, Thank you for praying. She's still in hospital. Uh, They want to keep her in and do dialysis there at Royal Brisbane tomorrow. They want to take an extra three-odd litres of fluid off. so, uh, So she's in there. So Lord willing, she'll be home tomorrow. Um, but I was out, man, life was a long time getting home. So uh, we're just going to trust the Lord and see where the, where the spirit leads us tonight. Now I want to ask this question. Here is, here is the, uh, here is the thought for tonight. If you could ask anything from God, what would it be? What would it be? Now I know, look, I understand a question like that for some may require a bit of time to think about it. Uh, others perhaps might know, well, I know straight off the bat what I would ask God because I've been thinking about it for a long time. If there was anything that I could ask him, it would be, and you might be able to rattle that off. But most people would have to stop and think about that. If there is anything, what a blank check. If God gave you a blank check and said, you write it out and whatever it is, I'll give it to you. And no, I'm not advocating that God is a genie. But I'm going somewhere with this because I believe this that what we look at tonight or whatever it is that you say you would ask God, it wouldn't be what we look at tonight. I would say that 99% of Baptist people have not asked this. I would say 99% of conservative Christianity wouldn't have asked this. And the reason why is because Most people believe that they've already got it. And if they've already got it, why do we go to ask for it? We're going to go to Luke chapter 11. Sue Ellen, good evening. In Luke's gospel, there are two chapters that Luke delves into the subject of prayer as he relates it to Theophilus. Two very important chapters. Chapters Luke 11 and Luke 18. Sasha, good evening. And the great thing about the thing about prayer is that prayer is something that is a lifeline, if you please, from the believer to God. And uh, prayer is something, and I know that I'm talking to people that pray, all right? Um, I know, and I know that. Uh, we've been the recipients of that. I pray for you, you pray for me, you pray for my family, I pray for your family. But I reckon what we look at tonight, you've never asked God for. And it's probably because well-intentioned men have preached it away. In Luke chapter 11, verse number 1, the Bible says this, And it came to pass that as he, that's Jesus, was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. Now, Jesus is going to give a profound, powerful, life-changing message dealing with prayer. Many good books, Brendan, good evening, many good books have been written by Christian men on the subject of prayer. Good books. The best book that I've ever read is a book by John R. Rice titled Prayer, Asking and Receiving. 
If you could ever get a hold of that book, you might have to order it through Amazon. I would highly recommend you get that book. But there's a lot of good books out there on prayer. John R. Rice, a lot of uh, most well-known men, Toza, Finney, Torrey, uh, Spurgeon, uh, and the list goes on. The list goes on. Many good books. But the, the best person who've ever taught <laughs> about prayer put into print was the Lord Jesus Christ. As you think about what Jesus said in this one verse, there's three things in this one verse that I want to share with you before we move on. Firstly, it was common practice for Jesus to pray. Common practice. It says he was as he was praying. It's common practice. Sometimes Jesus prayed all night. Uh, sometimes Jesus prayed alone. Sometimes Jesus prayed in front of a multitude, like when he raised Lazarus from the dead. Sometimes Jesus prayed in the midst of a storm. Sometimes Jesus prayed over a meal. Jesus prayed. It was common practice for Jesus to pray. Jesus had a prayer life. Jesus was always communicating with the Father. As a matter of fact, if you want to know about the, uh, the, the high priestly prayer of Jesus, John chapter 17 is that high priestly prayer where you see Jesus praying to the Father. It's a great prayer to study. So not only was it a common practice, Fraser, good evening, not only was it common practice for Jesus to pray, but oftentimes there was a certain place. It says, as he was praying in a certain place, a certain place. Sometimes that certain place was a mountain. Sometimes that certain place was the Garden of Gethsemane. As a matter of fact, uh, East G'day from Sydney's eastern suburbs. Woohoo, hallelujah. Uh, sometimes, if you read John chapter 18, he would go over the brook Kidron into that garden uh, and he resorted there often. It was a certain place that Jesus would often go to to pray. And folks, let me just say this. It ought to be a common practice for us to pray and we ought to have a certain place where we go to pray. A certain place could be anywhere. A certain place could be in your car. It could be in your bedroom. It could be in an office. It could be somewhere where there's a certain place where you and the Lord just commune together, where you uh, fellowship with the Father. Uh, where you hear from the Holy Spirit in a certain place. But then there's a considered plea. The disciples said this, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. A considered plea. Common practice for Jesus to pray. A certain place where Jesus would pray. But then we see the disciples, uh, 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 a considered plea. Now, what Jesus is going to say is to his disciples, not just then, but to his disciples now. And the, the considered plea that his disciples gave Jesus then ought to be a considered plea that we as disciples should say to him now, Lord, teach us to pray. It's often been said time and time again, and I'll say it here, that the disciples never asked Jesus, Lord, teach us to preach or teach. I believe very strongly in preaching and teaching. Tracy, good evening. I believe very, very strongly in that, but they didn't ask Jesus to teach them how to preach. And I mean, I mean, who better, Sister Jean, good evening, who better to ask to teach and preach than the master teacher himself, Jesus? But that's not what they asked him. They said, Lord, teach us to pray. There was something about John's disciples that got their attention, how that John would teach his disciples to pray. And then it stirred within them, Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. And so, brethren, in this one verse, which sets us up for this amazing passage dealing with prayer. And folks, I know I'm talking to people that pray, but brethren, I want to encourage you about this certain thing to ask. Because if you could ask anything from God, what would it be? What would it be? And I guarantee you that the thing that we look at tonight, you would not have considered it. And you probably never have asked it. So he gives us the uh, what we call the, 
the, the model prayer, our Father which art in heaven. It's just a framework prayer. But then he, then, he, then he gives this illustration, a powerful illustration of a person who has a friend coming and he's got nothing to give him. And what we learn in verses 5 down to verse 8 of this important time is this, how specific we should be in prayer. He says in verse number 5, Which of you shall have a friend and shall go to him at midnight and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves. Three loaves. Why not two? Why not four? Why not five? Why not six? Why not one? Three loaves. Jesus is teaching us to be specific in prayer. It's important to be specific. That's why you should never feel ashamed to share prayer requests and be specific about it. Now, there's a time and a place for general praying. But brethren, if you can be specific in your sharing of your request and it helps people to be more specific in praying, that's a good thing. Jesus is teaching us in this first illustration about prayer, about being specific in prayer. How specific are you when you pray? Uh, you know, do you just pray generally because you're not sure? Most people who are not sure whether God will hear an answer are general in their prayer. Lord, I pray that you would bless Brother Fraser down there in Sydney when we ought to be praying specifically, Lord, deliver him from New South Wales. That should be very specific. I mean, who would want to live in New South Wales anyway? Lord, deliver him from the eastern suburbs of Sydney. That's being specific. Generally, it would be, Lord, just bless him and protect him, right? Now, again... Learn to be specific in your praying. The other thing that Jesus teaches us in verses 5 to 8 in this illustration, this first illustration of prayer, is about being persistent. Notice what he says in verse 8. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. What in the world does importunity mean? It basically means persistence. <laughs> nice one. Persistence. So Jesus is teaching us to be specific in prayer and Jesus is teaching us to be persistent in prayer. You know, sometimes we stop at the first obstacle. Well, you know, I prayed about this and nothing happened, so it must mean no. And we stop. No. Jesus is teaching us a profound lesson here. And again, I said yesterday, I believe in the sovereignty of God, but why would a sovereign God, in teaching us how to pray, get us to be specific and persistent if everything's just at his beck and call, everything's as well? No, he, 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 uh, he expects us to come before him with specific requests and to be persistent in our prayer requests. Don't stop praying for whatever it is until you know with certainty that either he said no or he said yes. Now, I know, I know, three times, yes, no, wait a minute. I, I get that, right? But sometimes we quit way too early when it comes to asking things from God. So he gives this illustration. Then he brings it down to life experience. And he says in, uh, uh, beg your pardon, he's, he's talking about, sorry, before I get it, the assurance in prayer. The assurance. Uh, verse 9, I say unto you, ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened. Everyone that asks will receive it. He that seeketh findeth and he that knocketh it shall be opened. The assurance in prayer. And by the way, if you were to write out under each other, ask, seek, knock, and you look at the first three letters, they spell ask. All right? Ah. Jesus expects you to ask and keep on asking because that's the Greek. The Greek is in the continual present tense. Ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking. Don't quit. Don't give up. Because everyone who asks receives and whoever seeks finds and whoever knocks it shall be open but don't give up and quit all right so we've got the assurance of prayer then we've got the life experience look at what he says in verse 11 if a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father so now he's appealing to the the father within them okay you dads i'm talking to you 
You who is a father, if your son shall come and, and, and asks you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will he give him a fish, a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? So as he goes right to the heart, Pastor James, good evening, as he goes right to the heart of the father, he says, if your son comes, would you give him the very opposite to that which he's asking? Of course not. If he's asking you a piece of bread, you're going to give him a piece of bread. If he's asking you an egg, he's going to give you that. You're not going to give him the opposite. And here is the most important lesson. This is the crux of what Jesus is saying in this lesson on prayer. Here it is. He says in verse 13, If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children... How much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? If you could ask anything of the Lord, what would it be? I would guarantee you that it wouldn't be the Holy Spirit. And the reason why you wouldn't ask for the Holy Spirit is because you, you believe you, you've got it all. You believe you've got it. Now, when you got saved, yeah, you received the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. But that's not what Jesus is teaching here. Because when you got saved, you didn't ask for the Holy Spirit, did you? When you got saved, you either asked for salvation, you either asked for forgiveness... You either asked for Jesus to come into your heart, you asked for salvation, and you got all of salvation. But you didn't ask for the Holy Spirit. Did you realize that the Holy Spirit is something that we must ask? It's expected for us to ask for the Holy Spirit. And so therefore, because... Today's Christianity has had this certain topic preached out of it. We are failing in the power of the Spirit in our life and churches. Oh, we know how to do church. We know about a schedule. We know about a program. We know about whatever. We know how to do it. We don't need the Holy Spirit. We know how to structure a message. We know how to re-preach a message, right? We don't need the Holy Spirit because we know how to do it. Well, brethren, that's a sad day in which we live because we and our churches are missing out on the Holy Ghost because we have never been taught to ask for the Holy Spirit. Now, when Matthew shared this, he said this, in regards to verse 13, if ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly father give good things to them that ask him? Matthew says good things, but Luke says the Holy Spirit. Why would Luke say the Holy Spirit? Well, you see, the Holy Spirit, according to Luke's gospel, is something that Luke emphasized. As a matter of fact, I think it was John Rice that said that the gospel of Luke is, I, I believe he said it this way, the work of the spirit in the life of the savior. Now, the other book that Luke wrote was the book of Acts, which John Rice said it was the work of the spirit in the life of his saints. Okay. So if you were to think about the first four chapters of the gospel of Luke, you see it very heavily influenced by the Holy Spirit. John was filled with the spirit in his mother's womb. Elizabeth was filled with the spirit and spoke out. Zacharias was filled with the spirit and prophesied. Uh, Mary had the Holy Spirit come upon her and birthed Jesus. Simeon had the Holy Spirit come upon him and led him to the temple. In, Acts, uh, in Luke chapter 4, Jesus was filled with the spirit. Jesus was led of the spirit in the wilderness. And in verse number 14, Jesus comes out in the power of the spirit. That's a lot of spirit. And there's a reason for that. So when we're talking about verse number 13 in Luke's gospel, when Jesus is saying, you know, as, as being evil, you know how to give good gifts unto your children. How much more shall your heavenly father give? Now, anything that is given is a gift. And in the Bible, the Holy Spirit is known as a gift. And it is a gift that very few have claimed possession of. I'm not saying we're not saved, we're sealed, we're indwelt, 
But we are running on the smell of an oily rag because we've not been anointed, endued, uh, received unction, uh, in uh, f- uh, filling, wh- however you want to term it, because we've never asked the Father for the Holy Spirit. For us as preachers, uh, it's for everybody, by the way, but we've got prayer. You know, before we preach, we ought to pray, Lord, would you give me, give me the Holy Ghost. I need the Holy Ghost to preach. And we do. But everybody needs the Holy Ghost to be a witness. Now, so I want you to think about this. It, Jesus is saying that it's a gift, the gift to them that ask him. So if you ask the Father for the gift of the Holy Ghost, will he give you something opposite? No. Everyone's worried about, because of the extremisms in Christendom today, everyone's worried about, oh, what about if I, uh, what about if I ask for something and I get something else? No, no, Jesus is teaching the opposite. He says, your heavenly Father will not give you the opposite of what you're asking. If you ask him for the Holy Ghost, he's not going to give you, uh, he's not going to give you a wrong spirit. He's going to give you this Holy Ghost. Even Paul teaches that. But let's go to Acts chapter 1, because again, we're seeing now Luke's other book. Oh, before I go there, go, go to Luke 24, because Luke finishes with this uh, working of the Spirit. Now, I want you to understand something very, very, very important. Please, very important. In Luke chapter 24, Jesus has already died, been buried and rose again. And according to Hebrews 9, at the death of the testator, a testament is of force. So Jesus for 40 days is ministering in the New Testament era. The New Testament began at the death of Jesus Christ. It was at that time that he breathed on his disciples and said, receive the Holy Ghost. Well, what did they receive? Well, they received the Holy Ghost. So now Jesus is saying something prolific, profound to these who have already received the indwelling of the Spirit. Listen to what he says in verse 49. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. So obviously they had not been endued, or that word endued means to be clothed with. They haven't been clothed with power from on high. They had received the indwelling, the breath of Jesus, the, received the spirit, because if he had left without giving them the spirit, he would have left them comfortless. And so now he's saying, you wait, you tarry in Jerusalem until you're endued with power. So Acts chapter 1 picks that up, verse five, uh, verse 4 and 5. Jesus said, Wait for the promise of the Father, which saith ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Ah, oh, there's that phrase, baptized with the Holy Ghost. Oh, no. Well, it's nothing to be afraid of because there's other terminologies that is used along with this one. As I said, Endued with power, baptized with the Holy Ghost, filled with the Holy Ghost, anointed the Holy Ghost, uh, received unction of the Holy Ghost. They're all meaning the same thing. Okay. So he says, uh, be baptized with the Holy Ghost. What does that mean? Well, he explains it in verse number eight. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. They hadn't received the power. The Holy Ghost is to come upon them. I believe firmly in a twofold work of the Spirit. I know many of my brethren don't. That's fine. I believe in a twofold work of the Holy Spirit. He comes and dwells within at salvation, but he can come upon in filling, in fulfillment, in unction, in anointing later on for service. One's for salvation, one's for service. Have you asked for the Holy Ghost? Most people, when asked the question, if you could ask anything of God, what would it be? It would be anything but, Lord, give me the Holy Ghost. It would be, Lord, I need a car. Lord, I need a house. Lord, I need this. Lord, I need that. Lord, whatever it is. Many things we would ask, but we wouldn't ask him for the Holy Ghost. Now, so he says it's the promise, all right, the promise. And and, and that promise is the promise of power. Go to chapter 2, chapter 2. Look at verse number 38. Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized. So repent, saved, baptized after salvation. And you receive the Holy Ghost at salvation. Uh, Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Not the gift of salvation. Not the gift of eternal life. But the gift of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is a gift. 
And the gift of the Holy Ghost can come to the believer after salvation. Now listen, verse 39. For the promise is unto you and to your children. Now, just in case you might think it was for the Jews of that day. Hold on. And to all that are afar off, that's us, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. The promise is unto you. Jesus spoke about that. Jesus spoke about that. Luke 24, 49, Acts chapter 1. Jesus spoke even before, back in Luke 11, when he's talking about prayer and, and what we're asking God for. How much more shall your Father give the Holy Ghost to them that ask him? Okay, So it's a promise that people, it's a gift, the gift of the Holy Ghost. Right Now, go with me to Acts chapter 8. Just two more passages, just two more scriptures. All right, Acts chapter 8. Peter's at Samaria, preaching revival preaching amazing revival. Look at verse 12. But when they believed Philip preaching, so what happens when you believe? You're saved, right? When they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized. They were baptized after they believed. They received believers' baptism. What happens when you believe? Or well, you receive the indwelling, the sealing of the Holy Spirit. Then you're baptized, right? And it talks about Simon himself believing. Look at verse number 14. Now, when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Oh, hang on a second. I thought, what's going on? Uh, they've they got to get saved. No, you don't get saved by people laying hands on you, by the way. Remember, they believed and then they were baptized. So they received the indwelling at salvation, when they believed, they were baptized up. And now they're receiving that gift, right? The promise of the Holy Ghost. Now notice what it says, verse 15. Who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord. They had only been baptized in water. They hadn't been baptized with the Holy Ghost. Now, again, baptized with the Holy Ghost could also mean endued with power, anointed of the Holy Ghost, filled with the Holy Ghost, unctioned of the Holy Ghost, right? But nonetheless, these apostles, these men of God came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. And by the way, you could go to Acts chapter 19 because it was the same question that Paul asked those 12 disciples. Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? Well, we've not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. Well, are you baptized? We were baptized under John's baptism. They were baptized in the name of the Lord. And then Paul laid their hands and prayed on the Holy Ghost. Come upon them. It is a pattern for New Testament Christianity. But 90%, I'll be generous, 90% of Baptist people, conservative people, have never asked the Father for a gift of the Holy Ghost. Never. And so he laid their hands on it, verse 17, and uh, they received the Holy Ghost. Now, notice something. Simon got a bit jealous. And he said, oh, I'll give you money uh, if you give me this power. Verse 20, but Peter said, unto then thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God. There's that word again, gift. Luke eleven thirteen, gift, right? Acts 1, Acts 2, gift, gift, gift. It's a gift, right? It's the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, I want to go to one last passage of scripture. Let's go to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. <laughs> I love this. I love it. I think it's so necessary. I love it, but I'm saddened by it because we, we, we are in a day in which we live. We need, to be, we need to be so empowered today, and yet we're not. We're, we're flailing around. We're floundering around. We're just... We're just, uh, we're just biding our time. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Oh, my, it's so bad. It's so hard. Oh, my, you know what I mean? It's like, wow, no. Give us the power of the Holy Ghost. We've got a job to do still. Okay? So listen to Timothy now. All right? Now, remember, salvation is not through laying on of hands. Salvation is by faith. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You ask Christ to save you. Right? That's how you're saved. Listen to what Paul said here in 2 Timothy chapter 1. Wherefore, verse 6, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God. Now, remember what Peter said back in Acts chapter 8 to Simon? 
You thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money? Well, what gift was that? That gift was the gift that was given through the laying on of hands, which was the receiving of the Holy Ghost that Jesus spoke about in Luke chapter 11, verse number 13, to receive that fullness, that power, that unction, that might of the Spirit. So he says this, he says, Stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. Again, salvation is not through the putting on of the hands, but if you see a pattern through the New Testament, the way that the Holy Ghost is often given is people pray. There is nothing wrong for a preacher to lay hands on a believer and say, Lord, would you give this person the gift of the Holy Ghost? Nothing wrong with that at all. Oh, but that looks and sounds charismatic. And this is the problem. We are doing a disservice to multitudes of believers because we don't preach it and we don't practice it. Verse 7, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. You see, you know, if you fathers on earth, if your son asks you for an egg, you're going to give him a serpent. If he asks for a piece of bread, you're going to give him stone. No, you're not going to give the opposite. You're going to give him that which he asked for. And God hasn't given us that spirit of fear, but he's given us a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. And he says, stir it up. It's in you. I laid hands on you. You were filled with the Holy Ghost. And by the way, in the, in the book of Acts, there was multiple times that this took place. So again, if I was to ask you, if you could ask anything of the Lord, what would it be? I would guarantee you that it wouldn't be to ask him for the Holy Spirit. Because you believe you've already got him, and you have, you got him at salvation. This is that sometimes people get confused, like, well, I've already got No, but he's talking about, have you asked for his anointing? Have you asked for his endowment? Have you asked for his unction? Have you asked for his fullness? Have you asked to be baptized with the Holy Ghost? If you ask, God says, how much more? Jesus said, how much more shall your heavenly father give you the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Have you asked? If you haven't, may I encourage you to ask. Ask him and you will receive. Amen. All right, let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for your goodness and your blessing to us. We praise you, Lord, for your word, and I pray, God, that you'll bless our night, bless our day tomorrow, and lead us as we go to church on Sunday. Be with us. Move in our midst, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, God bless you. Thank you. Appreciate being with you. Have a great day tomorrow. Have a great Sunday, and Lord willing, I'll see you Monday night. Until then, God bless. Goodbye for now.